Seth Godin is probably the most well-known name in the marketing world. He has 20 bestsellers in 37 languages, and he writes on topics such as marketing, consistency, leadership, creative work, and he also writes a blog post every single day, and he's been doing that for so long. Seth has numerous TED Talks that have amassed millions of views, and for those who aren't familiar with Seth's work, he believes in things like brands connecting with their audience as humans, he explains why people connect to brands and businesses, how marketing works, how to be remarkable in a world full of noise, and so much more. If you're into business, marketing, or understanding humans, this is an amazing insight into the mind of one of the top marketeers in the world. So... Hopefully, you'll like this episode with Seth Godin. Enjoy. And welcome to a freshly grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to freshly grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? I, I said, welcome to freshly grounded. Off that bit. Created by... And after that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? Seth, welcome to the podcast. An absolute honor to have you on. Thanks, Faisal. It's good to see you. Amazing. Um, okay, so I'm, if it's okay with you, I want to dive straight in, conscious of your time. And uh, lots I want to talk to you about. Much of it uh, selfish. I want to benefit from you myself as much as I can as well. Um, so I wanted to start by talking a bit about storytelling. Again, selfishly, I want to reap the benefit from that conversation. It's an area uh, I know I'd like to improve on. Um, so even if we kind of put your books aside for a second, you seem to have mastered the art of storytelling in your keynote speeches, your podcast interviews, uh, of course, through your work. So I put out a tweet a few days ago. It vaguely reads, uh, I'd love to get better at the art of storytelling. The perfection seems to be in knowing the exact time to give the punchline. Give it away too soon. And what you say after doesn't hold much weight, but also don't wait too long so that people are bored of the story. So how do you essentially deconstruct an experience you've had so that you can essentially reconstruct it in story form for others? Or, you know, it can also work for kind of like introducing a product to market, for example. Well, that's a complicated question. And <laughs> I'm going to start with a, with a simple answer and then we can go as deep into it as you'd like. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about stories. Stories don't start with once upon a ta time and stories don't usually have a punchline. Uh, if you get rejected, for example, whether it's for a job or a date or anything, they don't know you. They don't know you as well as you know you. They haven't been to all the places you've been. They haven't seen you all the time. All they know is your story. All they know is the shadow that you cast for them. And that is what they rejected, not you. So we have to begin by understanding that everyone has a noise in their head. And the noise in your head is different than the noise in my head. And once I can acknowledge that we each have a different thing that we are wrestling with, we understand that stories are a service. They are a service because what they're doing is showing up to help the other person make a choice that they're going to be glad that they made. So that is what a story is. In a blind taste test, you can't tell one wine from another, nor can you tell Pumas from Adidas from Nike, that it's the story that you tell yourself about that wine or those sneakers, that is what is on offer. So with that said, I've defined, and my friend Bernadette Jiwa defined story much more broadly than you just did. And I think that while on occasion I can spin a decent yarn, most of what I am trying to do is bring empathy to the way I bring ideas to the world by wrapping them in the kind of stories that other people can get their arms around. So that's my short answer to your complicated question. Fine. Okay. So uh, somewhat empathy driven, trying to understand the listener um, more than just trying to spit out what you want to say, right? Well, what you want to say, why do you want to say it at all? And Fine. understand Fine. that we are leaving clues everywhere we go. So behind you on the wall is a neon light is a sign from the British subway and is something that seems to be about coffee. Yep. These are choices, right? These are totems and, and choices. I am talking to you wearing a Patagonia shirt. That's a choice. 
Um, we make these choices in obvious and trivial ways, like what kind of glasses we wear, but also in really significant ways when we act in when no one else is looking or when we think no one else is looking. That's part of our story as well. And so the reason this is hard for so many marketers is they're looking for the shortcut. They're looking for the hustle. They're looking for the, how do I write a tweet that goes viral? Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, how do I live a life and build a, a, a trajectory so that no matter how somebody looks at it, they're going to see the story I'm trying to tell. Amazing. Okay, that, that kind of leads us naturally, I guess, then to speak a bit about purpose. I did want to speak to you about purpose because I think it resonates a lot with our audience. Um, so, so kind of, I, I've seen through your work, this huge emphasis that's been put behind purpose and purpose when kind of shipping creative work. Uh, I think it's something that massively relates to, I think, any, well, everybody, humans in general. Um, if we talk a bit about the uh, approach of generosity to marketing, I think one of the kind of uh, quotes in, in one of your interviews was that the purpose of shipping the work is not so you can come out ahead, but the purpose of the shipping the work is to make things better. Can you tell me a bit more about why there should be a purpose behind your work? Okay, so we have to talk about the difference between having a purpose and doing something on purpose. Okay. And English is the only language I speak. I have no idea if this works in other languages around the world, but there is a difference between having a purpose and doing something on purpose. If you build a, a house and the doorknob doesn't open the door when you turn it, you have done a bad job of building that door because the door has a purpose in the sense that you are intentionally trying to create something when you put that effort into it. And I think that that opens the door, sorry for the pun, to design thinking. Design thinking is who's it for and what's it for? This thing I'm going to bother making, who exactly am I seeking to change? What is the change I seek to make? And if you don't have the answer to those questions, please don't waste my time. Don't waste my time on social media. Don't waste my time with your ads. Don't waste my time trying to raise money. Just don't waste my time. You should be really clear. Who's it for and what's it for? That is very different than asserting that you as a human have a purpose. Because when you say you as a human have a purpose, now you've made it very complicated. Because, um, and my friend Simon Sinek has uh, largely uh, created noise around this, which he regrets about the starting with why. You know, the, the purpose of a coffee company or a book publishing company or a pharmaceutical company may be to enable future generations to live healthier lives, blah, blah, blah. But actually they went to work today to make a salary. And what they really do is run a business. One of the things that can help them run that business is to be intentional, to have a purpose to the work they do, but their purpose is, this is my job. That's okay. That's totally okay. Cause it's honest and it gives you a place to start. But where I am encouraging people to go is to be really clear about why they're even bothering to do a specific thing and the change they seek to make. Do you think that it's uh, kind of in the, in the fast paced world that we're living in, in the kind of instant gratification world we're living in with, with, with younger and younger creators, I suppose like less experienced people coming into the world of business that we are seeing like a, a, a rise of people trying to get those quick wins as opposed to thinking about why, what is the purpose of this product, this, this, this service, um, how can it have longevity uh, and so on and so forth? Well, it's been going on for 25 years. You know, I started one of the first internet companies and we were surrounded by companies and individuals who were looking for a quick hit, which you can get by being a troll, which you can get by finding a shortcut, which you can get by, you know, winning the internet for a day. And I've written 9,000 blog posts and not one of them has won the internet. Not one of them has been a home run. But all the people who were blogging when I started are gone. And the people who were blogging 15 years ago are gone. And the thing is, the way forward very clearly is by hitting one single after another, to use a baseball analogy, not by trying to hustle your way into some quick win and getting picked. And you may want to believe that you're going to be the next Kardashian, but we already have a Kardashian and that's plenty. You're not going to be the next Kardashian. That spot is taken. And so, you know, one of the 
action figures on my desk is uh, Jerry Garcia. And the thing about Jerry is the Grateful Dead were the number one touring band in the United States for 10 years out of 15. Number one, more than the Stones, more than anybody you can mention. And yet they did it that whole time with only one top 40 hit. And that was at the end of their career. They weren't in the business of getting a hit. They were in the business of doing their practice. How, how does that tie into then quitting? And, and because a consistency, I suppose, is about discipline. And when you, a lot of people start projects, you start from passion. How can you have the longevity where once it start, stops becoming, I suppose, as fun, you continue to have that discipline so that you can keep hitting those singles? So the idea of quitting, which I wrote a book about, is really straightforward. I'm in favor of quitting. I just don't think you should quit when it gets hard because that's when everyone quits. People quit on their way to becoming doctors at organic chemistry. Organic chemistry exists to get you to quit. So what I'm saying is don't even start down the path of being a doctor unless you are prepared to make it through organic chemistry. Don't even start down the path of being a thought leader, uh, a plumbing contractor, whatever project you want to work on, unless you have identified before you start where the hard part is, right? So in the US, a lot of people join a gym right after uh, the holidays, right around Boxing Day. And um, they all quit in the end of February because the first six weeks, they got a whole bunch of enthusiasm and then it gets hard. And that's why uh, there are fewer fit people because when it gets hard, they quit. A lot of people quit the Boston Marathon at mile 20. They quit at mile 20 because that's when it gets hard. Don't enter the marathon if you're not prepared to run through mile 20. That's the point. That's the hard part. So acknowledging that quitting is real and that you should quit before you start or quit when it's truly a dead end, but never quit when you get to the hard part because that's the way you waste the maximum amount of time and effort. Thanks for that. Um... I um there's there's a few other kind of like uh, uh, anecdotes or or kind of stuff I've read about you whether it's through your books uh, or through consuming your um, keynote uh, talks that I want to delve into. One of them is uh, the idea which I found very intriguing uh, it, uh, about kind of not necessarily being obsessed with uh, the data because that's looking kind of. Uh, backwards. So I want to uh, prerequisite this or, or, or kind of preface it with a story. And uh, the story is essentially, I was when I was very early in business, around seven years ago, very young, and a fairly successful multi-million dollar company CEO offered to take me for tea. Very British, I know. <laughs> uh, and also sounds fairly dodgy, but don't worry, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so he works in the fashion retail industry. And he told me that they spend tens of thousands of dollars per month on an agency that is basically paid to predict uh, the next big thing in clothing. They go to runways and fashion weeks all over the world and their whole job and the reason they get paid so much is just to guess what the future holds. And I think that's when it hit me that that is true for any industry. And I suppose the secret is in predicting the future if, if you can. Um, can you talk to me a bit about that? I've seen you mention uh, uh, kind of not getting too obsessed with data alone uh, and trying to figure out what, uh, trying to figure out what your consumer is going to do next is, is I suppose, where the sweet spot lies. Um, I think there are some industries where this is very smart. If you are an industry, particularly if right in the name of it is the word fashion, uh, what it describes are cultural waves of acceptance that uh, the people who make appliances, you might not know this, uh, they meet uh, regularly to decide what color appliances are going to be three years from now because oh. no one wants to be busy making purple appliances when no one wants purple appliances so they just decided let's all make the same colors at the same time and no one will get stuck and so if you're a, a big organization working in an industry where there are waves of fashion and where you are not able to single-handedly change the future then what you are describing makes sense where it doesn't make sense is a where you are big enough and technically facile enough to actually change the future, in which case you should ignore the trends. And an example of this might be the pioneers in electric cars or the pioneers in certain kinds of social media interactions. If you go first, 
and do it well, it doesn't matter what the trends are, you will get it right. And, or if you are small, because if you are small, I am, I think you are, you don't care what the big trends are. Your goal is the smallest viable audience, not the biggest possible audience. And so in my case, I can see, I knew what the trends were. The trends were going to be vapid, shallow, Twitter, tiktok kind of content that people would just consume like candy. I had no interest. I don't need it. Because if I have a million people who like my work, that's plenty. And I don't need to chase the next platform because I don't want to be in the chasing business. I've seen... Um... Uh, I, I, I've seen that in your work. And so I'm just going to turn the AC on here. So I'm currently in the UAE. So uh, I've just moved from London a couple of months ago. So I'm kind of going oh, from- Oh, good timing. Yeah, yeah. Good timing. Good timing. Yeah. He, decide, he decides to move to the Middle East for the summer. <laughs> yeah, was, uh... Hey guys, you're probably watching Seth Godin drop some knowledge right now on business and marketing. And Faisal nodded along like this. Yeah, me just nodding along. <laughs> yeah. And you're probably thinking, let me get back to Seth Godin. But before you do that... Yeah, you can't. Sorry, yeah. we we're telling you something. No it's interruption. Time to stop. No interruption. So guys, uh, we're interrupting this, uh, this pod to say, if you want more content, if you're liking this content and you want to get more content and freshly grounded, but a more relaxed, two lads having a chat, sometimes three lads having a chat, sometimes having some carrot tea, yeah. sometimes eating a sandwich. Sometimes a bit of banter. Yeah, a bit of banter. Um... It sounds like Inner Circle is your, is your, is your people. Yeah. Uh, every single week, you get an extra episode of Fresh and Grounded of me and Kaya having a chin wagon and natter. And you can join us at freshlygrounded.com forward slash Inner Circle. You should join us. You must, almost. Yeah. Not must. It's not compulsory. Highly but recommended. Yeah. From us. Yeah, and that, should, that holds weight. It does. Um, okay, so I, I do want to talk about the smallest viable audience thing. Um, but I'm going to put it on hold for a second because um, there's a few other bits that I want to touch on. If we get time, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, brands uh, making the audience feel human or, or, or generally like I know you're kind of uh, uh, the, the, the human aspect of a brand and how it kind of speaks to its audience uh, seems to be something that's very important to you uh, and should be important to all businesses and brands, essentially, if they want to be successful. I, I, speaking about TikTok and social media, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, because I know you just said that, like, you know, you try and stay clear from that from your personal brand. I've noticed a, a, a trend recently where TikTok, oh, sorry, not TikTok, but social media in general, big brands, they've, they, they've changed the way they're posting on social media and quality doesn't seem to matter anymore. When I say quality, I mean the quality of the camera, right? Things are on iPhone. So there's a company that comes to mind. I won't mention them. A huge company in the sports in the sports world. And these guys, you know, one year ago, their their imagery on Instagram and on Facebook was high quality professional shots of their clothing and stuff like that. Now it's like, you know, memes to do with sports. And it's going and it's doing sure. so well. My question, I suppose, I don't have an actual question. Really, it's like, what does that mean? Are we seeing a huge shift? Like, what does that mean about the consumer? Is the consumer changing? Um, this is a little off the topic, but it's something I'm interested in. So I'll talk okay, about. fine, fine. Uh, people who care about typography had their hearts broken about 10 years ago, because once you give everybody the ability to set type, everyone will set type. And so the internet wrecked it. You know, this is the new project that I just led. And Amazing. if you look inside, it's beautiful. It's beautifully laid out. We understand white space and margins and type. And that's just because I care. The fact is that most people didn't care about typography and they wrecked it. And what we're seeing now that you've given everyone a camera, is if you give everyone a camera, they're going to use it. And the company you're talking about did not lazily or accidentally end up going lo-fi. They did it on purpose and spent a fortune to do it because they're manipulating people and they're trying to look, quote, authentic, unquote, by doing what the kids are doing these days. And... Um, that's chasing. And if you want to chase, go ahead. You just better be good at it. And it won't last. What always happens is things, you know, there's a race, there's scaling, and then it becomes stable. And once it becomes stable, quality starts to come back. Once it becomes stable, then the only way to win is actually to make it better, not hipper. And so 
I think that we're going to see the quality of video come back. It's not going to look like a movie from 1980. There's always going to be quick cuts and stuff that young, untrained people are going to do. Um, so that keeps changing and it has to be in the right vernacular. But I don't want to ever give people advice about how to chase because there are other people who are way better than me at the chasing thing. Wow, that's really interesting uh, to hear. I suppose like the question that initially comes to mind then when I hear that is how 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 does a brand then balance seeing their kind of north star their end goal believing staying firm on it um and and seeing like loads of opportunities where oh we can we can uh, like grab an opportunity there grab an opportunity there and you kind of fall off track is there a way to fall off track sometimes and carry on going uh, straight is that what you were kind of um talking about when you kind of said make mistakes often as long as you don't make the same mistakes well the first half of the question is super simple. The objective of any brand that matters has to be, how am I going to get my fans to tell other people? Not how do I win the current battle for meme domination, right? right. Because you can't, you can't regularly do that. On the other hand, you know, there's a, a TV show from South Korea uh, that my wife and I started watching once a week. And when it came out in South Korea, it was one of the lowest ranked shows. And the second week, it had twice the audience. And the third week, it had four times the audience. And by the eighth week, according to the data I'm seeing, which I might be wrong about, it was one of the most popular shows in South Korea in eight weeks. Is that because they figured out how to good, run good promotion? I don't think so. I think it happened because 10,000 people saw the first episode and told everyone they knew. That is the North Star. The North Star is is this work worth talking about? How, how do you uh, focus on, on, on those people, those people that are going to speak about your product, uh, so your smallest viable audience? And then naturally, I've heard you mention that that is actually the way to get the big audience, I suppose. Like you, when you get the small viable audience and you're, and you're appealing to them, they will speak to others. When you then get there and you've got the big audience, how do you maintain the how do you maintain growth and, and, and still keeping everybody, having that human touch with everybody? Because now you have the big audience. Well, the first thing I'd say is when you get that far, give me a call. Okay, most fine. People <laughs> all, most people don't get all the way to the end. Fine. You know, if we look at the most valuable company in the world, you have one of their products sitting right in front of you. Now, I was there in 1983 as a beta tester for the Mac. And I promise, Faisal, you weren't. You, in 1983, you were not a Mac user the way I was. And the number of people who used a Mac in January 1984 was 10,000. And now look what happened. So then what you do is you make one of these. And again, at the beginning, the first people who bought one, there were 10,000, 50,000, that's all. And then it spread and a network effect kicks in. And then Tim Cook, who is not an innovator by any stretch of the imagination, figures out how to answer your question, which is once you've reached a point where it is a cultural standard, what do you do? Well, what you do is you get boring and consistent and you extract profits. And that's how you build the most profitable company, the most valuable company in the history of the world. Oh, okay, fine. Um, let's, if, if we move the discussion back to the streaks, uh, then we, you, I, in, in practice, you mentioned uh, the importance of streaks, consistency, like you just said there. And I just mentioned kind of the idea of uh, making mistakes often, as long as you don't make the same mistake again. How can somebody become comfortable being wrong? If they make a mistake, well, how do you they be... realize they're wrong. Right. How do you become comfortable uh, making tahini? Right. Because most people make tahini sauce wrong, but then they figure it out and they make it right. But if you say, I'm petrified of making a mistake in the kitchen, You'll never learn to cook. Learning to cook is exactly the same thing as learning to market anything. You read some recipes, you can buy a cookbook, but that's not going to teach you how to cook. You cook by making mistakes and making mistakes on your way to making it better. And I have made more mistakes and failed more times than anyone who is listening to this. And I'm super proud of that. And I treasure every one of them way more than I treasure my successes. Because success, you can say, is luck. 
but failure, failure takes guts. There's a, there's a um, kind of like ancient uh, Arabic proverb that uh, is something like um, criticism and praise should affect a person the same. Essentially, they shouldn't affect a person. Uh, do you agree with that? Like, because I've heard you speak about criticism. I'm eager to speak to you about criticism because, of course, like anybody who puts their face out on the internet, I've also received criticism on podcasts like once or twice. So I want to speak to you about that. But firstly, on that proverb, do you think that we should look at praise in the same way as criticism, i.e. ignore it all? That's a great question. And if you've only been criticized for the podcast twice, good for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. The word should is challenging because the word should is very similar to the word shame. Right. And I don't want to should anybody. What I would tell you is I wish that I could uh, leave criticism behind as easily as I leave praise behind. I try to do that, but it's not easy because I care very much about the people I'm serving and the work I do. So part of what I try to help people realize is instead of using the word criticism, we could use the word feedback, advice. That if you are uh, driving to um, Dubai and you're headed in the wrong direction, if somebody says Dubai's that way, they're not saying you're a bad person. They're not saying you're an idiot. They're just saying, perhaps if you took a U-turn, you would get to where you're going a little faster. The only correct response to that is thank you. And learning to say thank you to something that feels like criticism is a step in the right direction. Um, in terms of praise, I completely com agree with the proverb, which is seeking praise is a form of reassurance and it gets in the way of doing the work you seek to do. It's, it's funny because I think I've heard so many content creators mention this and it, it rings true to me as well that when you start reading comments or you start reading messages, what happens is the uh, or the the praise goes in through one ear and out the other, and the criticism stays with you. And you start questioning, well, am I doing the right thing? Should I change the yeah. the, the, the the strategy? All because of kind of like one comment. And I suppose um, it's interesting how that's the thing that sticks out. Yes, exactly. And that's part of our culture. It's part of the way we were raised. It's part of human nature. Um, it. I mean, you, if you have a puppy at home, it's exactly the same thing. You can say good dog to a puppy once uh, or a hundred times, and it doesn't matter as much as yelling at the dog was. Um, because evolutionarily, if you're in a situation of danger, you could die. Whereas when you're in a situation of someone saying, I love you, that's nice, but it has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to have grandchildren. So with that said, my discipline is not getting comfortable with criticism. My discipline is don't read the comments. I haven't read a review uh, on Amazon of my work in 10 years, and I'm not going to start because it's not, it never helped my write, writing get better. It just paralyzed me. I don't have comments on my blog. If you want to write about my blog, please start your own blog. That's your front yard. You can do anything you want about me on your blog, but my blog is for my work. Do, do you set yourself kind of hard and fast rules like that generally across the board in, 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 in other places? Yeah. I find that I have to set rules for myself that almost like this is what I do. This is what I don't do. And at that point, it's like, okay, fine. I, I Faisal, don't read comments. And that's now a rule for me. Is that something that you do across the board? Oh, yeah. I have rules because my work is to violate norms and do things that other people think are unreasonable. Everything else in my life is based on a series of principles. Of course, I'm a hypocrite, but I try really hard to say, I make it, like I haven't had a piece of meat in more than 30 years. Wow. And, you know, it was once I made the decision, I was done. And 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I figured out that wheat was calling, causing my shoulders to hurt. And I haven't had a grain of wheat since then. I mean, like, I have to debate it with myself, right? I just, I don't miss cheese. I don't miss ice cream because I don't eat that. Done. And that makes my life so much simpler because I don't spend any time debating things with myself. Okay, can you, would you be willing to uh, be vulnerable and perhaps share with us, it could be a very vague one, but a rule that you've implemented that perhaps all of us could benefit from perhaps in, uh, implementing in our life? A Seth Godin rule. 
<laughs> no coffee um, after 5 p.m. maybe. No, the... Um, don't seek reassurance. That's a hard one. It's totally worth it. Wow, you know, that rings so many bells that's that's uh that's hit me hard that one has because i sometimes talk to people about this uh one of my early memories of school it wasn't that early because i was in high school to be honest but as in it's a memory from school that i remember really sharply and it was there was a substitute tutor, uh, teacher he'd come in for a good six to eight months and it was in he was, he was a maths teacher and i would often ask him if i had the right answer and on his last day when he was leaving for some reason, I, I I was staying behind. It was just him and I in the room. And it was his last lesson. He was going back to Australia after this. And he sat down next to me. He said, Faisal, you constantly are asking if you got the right answer after you've done your work. And the answer is always right. You need to stop picking up, putting up your hand and asking if it's right, because it is right. And uh, man, I, I, it's, it's something I'm still working on, but it's something that just I've never forgotten that piece of advice. It's, it's amazing that you now bring you up as, again, somebody I see as a mentor. I mean, I, I suppose a lot of people have this relationship with you where it's like a one-way relationship. You're like their mentor for years and you're like meeting them for the first time. But it's interesting that you, you say that. I hope that you will use Facebook to find this person and send them a note. I will try my best. It's a, I will try my best. That's a very good, that's a very good idea. I will look for them. Um, okay, uh, Seth. Where am I? Where, where shall I go from here? Um, okay. Let's talk about, a bit about the tribe. Tribe mentality, uh, tribe marketing. Um, I wanted to dig into it slightly. So there was a, a post going around on social media and uh, the post was uh, an anecdote being shared by a marketer and it was, I'm going to be really bad at explaining it. Um, hotels who have signs, I don't know if you heard this one, uh, hotels uh, who have signs saying, please recycle your towels. Uh, a researcher came along, he changed uh, the, 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 the statement to other people in this room recycle their towels, please recycle yours, and it increased recycling towels by 26%. And I instantly I thought of the tribe mentality that you've spoken about with kind of the marathon and people know they're not going to win. So can you talk to us a little about the tribe mentality, uh, specifically in marketing, if somebody owns or runs a brand or a side hustle, how can they benefit from understanding this? Okay, so your ancestors and mine, uh, used to organize in tribes. And that term means different things in different parts of the world. But generally what it means is a group of 150 people who live together, who support each other, who created microculture. And I believe that's hardwired into us. It's part of the, the nature of our culture. Who are we with? What do people like us do? And so there's a tribe of people who go to TED conferences and there's a tribe of people who eat at fancy restaurants. And there's a tribe of people in every religious sect that people like us do things like this. And that's part of what it means to be human. We can't deny that, but we can use it to make things better. And what we have the chance to do is spend a lot of our storytelling time, not saying, I have this engineered widget, please give me money. But to say, there's a group of people that I am leading, narrating, connecting, working with and for. And this group of people has come to the conclusion that people like us do things like this. And when, quote, marketers, and I'm going to put this in quotes because I don't want to call those people marketers, try to manipulate folks with copywriting, I'm glad when people recycle towels. But let's be clear, you're doing it to manipulate people so you can spend less money on your laundry, not because you actually care about it. Well, that's going to burn out that whole expression that in terms of people believing you, and it's not gonna work anymore. It happens every time hustles show up in marketing. But that's not the point of thinking about tribes. The point of thinking about tribes is find your smallest viable audience, connect them, create a narrative, tell a story that spreads, establish what people like us do, repeat. That is the essence of what it truly means to be a marketer. Amazing. I, I, uh, I, we, we, when we first started the podcast, we, it, which is called Freshly Grounded, the FG, we uh, were trying to think of a name to kind of 
uh, to create a, I suppose, like this, uh, not loyalty, but uh, this flag waving of of the podcast, right? Like, because the idea behind it was that we want to be kind of a voice for the voiceless, right? Like, um, and so we create, we called it the FG Tribe, which was really interesting because I found out then about the tribe thing later. But um, I, I, it, it resonates a lot, and I think when when people feel like there's somebody who uh, is waving the flag of their people, it's a really special feeling. That's correct. And, you know, you, you talked about uh, naming the podcast, the name, you know, the word Nike, hard to pronounce, people don't know its relationship to mythology. The word Starbucks, named after an obscure character from an obscure novel that most people haven't met, also containing the word bucks for an expensive, I mean, there's nothing about the name Starbucks or Nike or Adidas or Puma or Apple that makes it a good name. That's not what makes something a good name. What makes something a good name is when you associate it with the feeling, when you associate it with you and where you seek to go. And so good on you that you've found this group of people that are relying on you to help them with their narration. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll end Seth with talking about uh, talent, talent versus skill. I didn't want to finish this conversation without having mm-hmm. that chat because it was incredibly motivating to me when I heard you speak about this. Uh, and I think it'll be very motivating to our audience, anybody who hasn't heard kind of your take on talent. So um, <clears throat> the question I wrote, I'll read out the question I wrote, I guess, but you can kind of take it as sure. however, however you want. So I said that um, it's widely known that you're very pro skill uh, and that skills can be taught and and at least in the creative work through practice and action so my question was which I, I don't know about the wording now do you dislike talent talk because it can be used to drive I suppose like a victim mentality like I can't do this because it's not a natural gift of mine for example correct fine talents are out of your control and I can't play basketball and I'm just guessing neither can you I can't and you and I could whine all day long about the fact that we were deprived by our great, 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 great grandparents of the ability to play professional basketball. So what? What good is that going to do us? On the other hand, when someone says, oh, I love that you write. I don't have the talent to write. I look at them. And I say, well, you can speak. Why, don't you, why aren't you writing down what you say? Of course, you have the talent to write. You just haven't developed this skill because you don't care enough. And the really good news about talent versus skill is skills are learnable. If you care enough, you can have them. If you are able to throw and catch one ball, you can learn to juggle. That's great news because juggling is not a talent. Juggling is a skill. And when we think about the things that we are looking for in our world today, very few of them have to do with being seven feet tall. And a lot of them have to do with caring enough to earn a skill. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, Seth, thank you for your time uh, as well. I, I, I really do appreciate it. I kind of went out on a whim to send you an email and uh, you were very, very fast in your response. I've actually, uh, I've, I found that the kind of the, the most productive of people, the people who I look up to the most tend to be very uh, quick and efficient. I, your, I think your email was two lines and perhaps like seven words uh, it was very similar when I, I i chanced it in the early stages of the podcast by shooting a message out to uh alan uh i think it was alan uh hope uh, am i getting the name wrong the ceo of unilever and um i sent out an email introducing the pod um explaining the, our market our audience and he just sent a, a very fast very efficient response and it, it you 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 tend to notice with kind of high performers they're very attentive to action very attentive to to to, to getting things done and efficiency and i appreciate that um before we leave why did you say yes <laughs> well that seems like you're asking for reassurance and i'm not going to offer it to you oh wow but i will tell you that uh people of privilege people who have traditionally been uh, assigned to a higher caste have plenty of things that going for them that they don't need my help But when someone shows up and says, I am trying to narrate to an underserved audience, when I'm trying to organize people who have traditionally been left out of the conversation, it's more interesting for me to be able to help those people. I can't help all of them. And if someone sends me an unsolicited email, I'm almost certainly going to say, no, thanks. I can't. Sorry. Um, Because unsolicited emails are not the way to move forward. You don't uh, achieve where you're going by taking a long shot and, and 
pitch, pitching someone. And so um, I think it's a mistake to describe your email to me as going out on a limb or being risky because you took no risk whatsoever. You just took my time, but you've earned at some level the right to do that because you've shown up. What episode is this? A lot. Uh, you've done uh, a like lot of these. 287 or something. Yeah. Right. So if someone shows up for years and years and years, that's not a risk. It's not an obligation, but it's an opportunity. And I want more of that in the world. So I'm trying to put my time where my desire is. Well, Seth Godin, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to meet you, sir. But um, I hope that one day we can meet in person. Uh, thank you so much. And I, again, I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Faisal. Be well. Take care, Seth.